is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Twilight Highlight Zone podcast. This is our sixth episode. I am your host for this week, Jeff Cork, joined today by Ben Hansen. Hello, Jeff Cork. Hello, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Let's get this road on the show. All right, I'm going to play my hand immediately. This was a, like a whole segment, like this whole sequence, stinkers. That's I, what I'm going to say. I'm with you. There are a couple stands out, standouts, really only one standout as far as I'm concerned, but I'm curious to see how much you hated certain episodes. I, I certainly hated some. They stand out maybe like a squirrel that hasn't been run over enough on the road and there's uh-huh. just like part of its tail that flaps up as you, as you pass by. That's like the standout on the standout <laughs> episode. Not a great analogy, but you know. Yeah, I'm with you. So these are episodes 26 through 30. That is correct. All right, and it starts with? It starts with Execution. Is this promising title? Yeah. Well, tell us about it. You know it's going to be action-packed. All right, Execution starts out in the Wild West. A man is being hung his body suddenly disappears as he's dangling from the rope. He is teleported to modern times, 1959, theoretically, yep. by a scientist. The scientist uh, tries to show him the world. The guy ends up killing the scientist because he's an evil man. He runs amok. Oh, yeah. And then he eventually is killed by another evil man in the present. And then that present day man is teleported back to the noose. And everyone is confused about what is going on. Yeah. But the, the premise of the episode is... You know, justice will be served, evil knows no bounds, that it, sort of thing. It will be served except for the time that it is not served <laughs> in, in the case of the guy who was supposed to be hung in the beginning of the episode. Well, I mean, you could say it is served because he <gasps> gets teleported to the future and is tortured by our present day. That's true. Hands over his ears. Everything is so dang loud. Which there's a water right? show. He, he Did you notice that when he runs through the streets, there's yeah. so, neon lights, water show? So it has that fun premise that we complained about uh, the last flight, that other episode not having, mm-hmm. of man from the past going to the future. And the entire episode is basically him trying to adjust to our modern world and just being overwhelmed by everything. Oh, and the scientist immediately, I don't i don't know how time travel works. He recognizes, like from the outset, I have made a bad call here because well, he sees like the rope burn around the guy's neck. And he immediately knows what it is, which is a cool detail. And yeah. He goes and records his Bioshock audio log talking yeah. about this man is pure evil. What yeah. have I wrought? Yeah. And when those two get in a tussle, um, did you see the stunt work on that, by the way? Cork, we say this is a bad block of episodes. The stunt work in this five-episode batch is amazing. I am surprised that the guy who played the scientist, maybe he did actually die. Because it, the way that he flipped and landed on his neck. Over I was the just, desk? Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. We're going to be getting to some more stunt work later yeah. on that I definitely I want to point out. Actors but. were basically, if I'm not mistaken, it wasn't, they were disposable at the time. You could, <laughs> as long as you paid the widow, yeah. right, you could kill them. I think this is true. I read this on like a alternate Wikipedia somewhere. <laughs> right? It seemed legit. The but, text file on your desktop? Yeah, I think that guy, like future roles, he would just have to be in a wheelchair because that looked incredibly painful and judging by the actor that was used in this episode i'm guessing he was completely disposable and this is the third version because (laughs) the entire premise is this man is unbelievably evil yeah right in the beginning in the wild west all those guys are like oh you shot my buddy in the back what have you done you're pure evil when he just looks like a weird it's like glenn beck doing an impersonation of joker yeah it is the worst character yeah he does not convey evil he just conveys pudgy guy using a weird voice yeah he's it's not so great the, the weirdest part for me in this episode is after he, he kills the scientist right? right he runs out into the street because it's important that he gets overwhelmed immediately yeah and then he runs back to the scientist time lair yeah which is a robbery in progress right it just just seems really strange to me yeah that's true also i like the bit where he runs out into the street and it's that stupid crap where, you know, he doesn't understand what a car is, which is fine. Yeah. But he understands that it's an object moving towards him. But, like, he doesn't know that he has to get out of the street. He just yeah. kind of, like, stares awkwardly at it and is confused about roads, yeah. which I guess he shouldn't be. Then he goes into the bar and he, like, immediately, like, <laughs> knocks a jukebox out. Just punches it in the juke jaw. <laughs> I did like that detail, though, that his main complaint was it's so noisy. 
Yeah. And that is an interesting detail that you wouldn't think about too much. Going from the Wild West mm -hmm. to the middle of Manhattan, I think is where it was. But uh, you go to the any bar in the Wild West and there's that guy playing the piano. <laughs> That's true, but imagine like 70 of them. Yeah. So the best part is when he goes into that jukebox bar, whatever that place yeah. is, and uh, he's mesmerized by this window that's above the bar. And so the guy turns on the TV mm -hmm. and it's immediately <laughs> the worst show ever made where it's a cowboy yeah. looking directly at the TV yep. like some sort of crappy Wii game and slowly walking towards it mm -hmm. and proclaiming that the guy on the other end needs to draw. Yeah. So it's this weird first person cowboy show which doesn't exist it's the timing is unbelievable and the show is completely unbelievable. Well, it's like that, that old timey movie with the train hurtling toward the screen. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like entertainment, you know, the bar was pretty low. Yeah. So also, he shoots the TV. Yeah. And that the, the guy is just like, all right, that's going to cost you. And like you can, you can punch the snot out of my jukebox. <laughs> but when you blow up my TV box, it also just reminds me of like the home alone bit where like that movie was on TV where the dialogue perfectly perfectly conveys mm -hmm. what macaulay culkin's trying to get uh, yeah. the people on the other side of the door exactly all that crap so i mean this episode i i enjoyed it as oh, dumb as moments are yeah but the silly part let's just go over real quick oh, then yeah. he runs back there's the robbery in progress and the guy there's kind of like a you know honor among thieves you know a little professional right. courtesy here and then there's Too a much. big another fight there's like some choking with a curtain yeah rod and and then in, the bad guy gets sent forward and or a back in time we don't ever figure out what happened to the the cowboy, though, do we? Or is, is he killed? I think he's killed by the other robber. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, he get, duh, yeah. He he's choked, choked to death. Yeah. yeah. Poetic. Yeah, my mistake. Uh, the best part of this episode, yeah. which we forgot, uh, was when he's running around the streets like a madman, and he gets himself locked into the phone booth, much oh. like in the first episode. Uh, That's true. Lonely when he's in the phone booth. But he's locked in the phone booth, and the phone's going off. He doesn't know how to react to it. And then he just kicks out yeah. from one side of the phone booth and just bust through the side. That's another bit of awesome stunt work. Yeah. Just really violent and aggressive move. Mm -hmm. Yeah, All right, good so stuff. Where'd you land on this episode? Six. You know what? I gave this one an eight. Wow. I'm such a sucker for that premise of explaining the future to people from the past. I think that is so much fun. Really? And this episode certainly could have had more of it, and it was super hokey at times, especially the scientist parts. But yeah. I'm on board for it. Yeah. I, think it was I good, want to know what the guy's like ultimate plan was was he just plucking people at random or was it like all right the old west i got a 50 50 shot here it's either gonna be a sheriff or an outlaw <laughs> ah damn it you know yeah i don't know exactly how that worked i was expecting them to explain it by like saying that he had some article of clothing from this guy or somehow was able to mm -hmm. get the dna but it seemed just completely <laughs> random he yeah just brought in a neanderthal from the past that immediately just killed yeah. him yeah which he kind of did if you think about it. Really yeah. think about it. All right, what's the next one here, Cork? Uh, the Big Tall Wish. Oh, boy. Take it away. Oh, boy. So what we have here yeah. is a boxer kind of past his prime, right? Uh -huh. um, he's going to go for some fight where basically he's just going to go there, and I don't even know why he's there. But he's got this match. This kid who kind of lives in the same building says, I believe in you. I believe in you. I'm going to wish for you tonight. I want you to win. So... The boxing match beforehand there's like sleazy promoter there's a bit of a tussle the boxer hits the wall mm -hmm. in anger br like bruising his knuckles so then you think well this match is over it was pretty hopeless to begin with he gets knocked down the count out's going and then it cuts to the little boy wishing and it shows the boxer standing over the opponent he won somehow because right. of the power of wishes guy goes home the boxer everyone is congratulating him and then he just decides that that's not good enough and he's going to tell the little kid that he should he's too old to believe in wishes and then it undoes the wish and he comes to he's been knocked out comes back tells the kid that maybe you should believe hard <laughs> wishes end. the big tall wish the big tall wish indeed all right so can first, i call it, first of all i yeah. just want to say this one should be called the big distracting prosthetic <laughs> because like the, the boxer's fake nose uh -huh. is all I could look at that entire time. Yeah, they tried to really emphasize that this guy's seen rough times. He's explaining to the kid in the beginning, like all the yeah. different scars that he's gotten across the country, yeah. stuff like that. I also I was really confused about that relationship. So they just happened to live in the same building. Like yes. at first, it seemed obvious that it was a father son relationship, mm -hmm. but it wasn't. No, he was just like a renter, like a tenant in this building. He's friendly with the landlady, but in a cool way, but not in like a 
yeah, do you friendly think, with benefits. Do you think they implied, like maybe even like in the script, it implied that they were lovers? No, or I think that it was just a simpler time. I don't it was understand like, the simple. And she time. was just totally cool with him going to like see him in his bed when he was sleeping, and <laughs> yeah. it was like not a big deal. Yeah. So I mean, obviously there was a nice trusting relationship, but yeah, there's one bit where like he was like rubbing the kid's head, and he's like, "Oh, how did I get mixed up with you?" Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Please sure. tell us. Yeah, I would love to know. <laughs> because it's very confusing. Yeah. Uh, all right. This episode, I was not a fan of. So that. something, too, that I think that is very important here is yeah. that the entire cast is black. The first episode. Yeah. Yeah. Which was, reading, was, you know, at the time was fairly significant deal. Yeah. I guess uh, I was reading a little bit about this episode, and I guess uh, Twilight Zone won some awards. I don't know from what organization exactly for just like highlighting African-American community in episodes like this. I guess Mm -hmm. there's more episodes that come up. Uh, And Rod Serling had a quote in this piece I was reading where he's just talking about like, yeah, it turns out there's really great actors out there and everybody overlooks them and turns out they're just black. Yeah. Use the word Negro, but that's a weird word in this day and age, so I won't use it. It is. (laughs) Unless you're like a time traveler. (laughs) Could be. I don't know. So uh, the worst part of this episode, other than the pretty boring plot, uh, was the kid screaming the guy's name, which was Bali. Yeah. Just in the beginning, I thought this kid was a decent actor, but they make him go so Ooh. over the top and emotional, and it uh, ends with him just screaming, Bali, you've got to believe, Bali, you got to uh, believe. Well, that that comes after he, like, hugs the television, and he's right. got his face pushed against the glass as hard as it'll go. <laughs> just a big, tall wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, I mean... This episode started, I was I was pretty bored. Mm-hmm. Uh, when time froze, yeah. when the wish was being enacted yeah. and they were flip-flopping, I thought that was pretty cool because there was no music sting or yep. anything. So I thought it was my Netflix just yeah. freezing up at yeah. first. Did you uh, immediately stomp around your room? I was pretty angry. Called Comcast a couple times. <laughs> uh, so that was redeeming. And then it's like, all right, they just flip-flopped. I also thought it was a cool twist that when he stopped believing in the yeah. wish himself, that yep. it went back and reverted itself. Yeah, that was kind of cool. Other than that, it was just boredom layered on top of this kid screaming Bali over and over yeah. and over again. I, I have two points yes. that I want, I'd like to make before we Please. give our scores. First of all, we haven't talked about how they showed the boxing match, which was the weirdest thing. It was just extreme close-ups All everywhere. it was is just like close-ups of like a hand reaching into a popcorn bag and like uh-huh. munching and then like a woman's gloved hands like trembling over her face and not showing her face over and over again and then yeah. like someone's shoe or something. It just... It had the it had the quality of a vine where you can kind of see where the person says action, then they yeah. have to get the thing rolling. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's like maybe the director is like, "All right, I got a brilliant idea. We're going to be artistic. Yep, and we're going to save some money by lack of extras. Yep, let's just do super extreme close ups of all these weirdos. Yeah, that was strange. And at the same time, like at the very end, I can understand. No, I, now that I think about it, I don't understand this guy. Why he thinks like he's got this mission? Like, all right, I'm gonna teach this kid that the world is a miserable, awful place. Because he talks about his own childhood, you know, yeah. and he remembered when he got his face pushed down into the concrete and it wasn't right. soft or whatever. But it's right. just like this isn't your kid, man. And he's just like, put, like barreling up the stairs so he could tell his this kid not going. You know, don't believe in your dreams. That's childish <laughs> nonsense. Whatever. This bunch of crap. Yeah. It's like really, dude. Cork, this is the worst episode of the Twilight Zone that I've seen. Yeah. I give it a three. I give it a four. Okay. I mean, 16 millimeter shrine wasn't great, mm-hmm. but it at least had the fantasy fun ending of her going inside it. Yeah. It was, it was kind of campy. This, I just found boring. This is just a boxer being an asshole. Yeah. Ultimately. <laughs> That's basically what it came down to. Uh, this is foreshadowing though, because <gasps> there is a boxing episode coming up that yeah. I remember uh, watching in high school. That is awesome. Good. So, It'll be coming back. Good. The redemption round. Doesn't have a little kid named who screams out Bali, does it? <laughs> no, very few. Thank goodness. Uh, so the next episode is called A Nice Place to Visit. Captivating title. And the premise but a better place one. to rob. It's a Beastie it's Boys a... lyric for you. Oh, there we yeah, go. There, there you go. go. Cork. Hip hopper. Rip rapper. Uh, so this episode, it's all about a bank robber who gets shot by the cops. He mm-hmm. wakes up to see a rotund John Hammond. From Jurassic Park. Yes. Who says that he's his guide. Named Pip. Named Pip. And he's going to guide him around this world where everything seems to be on the up and up. Uh, he wins every time he gambles. He gets the ladies. Everything's cool. Uh, he then gets bored in this existence because he mm-hmm. finds out that he's dead. And he basically the guide loosely implies or is vague about whether or not it's heaven or hell. So he assumes it's heaven because everything's so cool. Mm-hmm. But after being there for a month. 
he realizes that he's super bored yeah. when he just gets everything he wants. And then it turns out that it's hell all along. Yep. Dun, dun, dun. No, he's, he, he does it like, I'm ready. I'm going to go to the other place. Oh, what do you mean? This is the other place. <laughs> and he just did, like the head backward and just keeps doing it forever. That was such an abrupt turn because throughout the rest of the episode, the fat John Hammond guy yeah. is pleasant. Oh, He's yeah. just a super nice guy just being casual about the whole thing. Like, yeah, remember that time you got shot in the face? Well, yeah. Like, over here, you're going to be just fine. Here's, here's yeah. some fine ladies for you. Oh, uh, he, he says something to the effect of like, hey, I need that like I need a hole in the head. Well, as a matter of fact, where you come from, you have a hole in the head. Mm. Yeah. 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 It's, it's pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then just the twist at the end, just the ultimate punchline of, oh, it was hell all along. And it's unclear if he's Satan or one of Satan's minions. Yeah, it doesn't matter. He, he refers to vaguely as like working for the big guy. Oh, he does. One of those okay. things, yeah. When they go and check out the records and whatnot. Yeah, I think records. at this point they're like, oh boy, in, in this first season we've already had several personifications of the devil himself yeah. and uh, death. Mm-hmm. So maybe we'll dial it back. Maybe like one degree of separation. We won't have the big man, <laughs> but you know, one of his trusted minions. Yeah, I yeah. mean, this is a recurring theme now, just having that weird spiritual guide. Yeah. It's come up in like three or four episodes mm-hmm. before. Um, so one thing, nerdy note. Did you notice this guy's name? What? It's Henry Francis. Which is from Mad Men. That's who Betty marries. Oh. As a, sorry, I had to get that in there. That's all right. Uh, also, like I like before he realizes that, I think it's before he realizes that he is dead mm-hmm. or before he understands who this fat guy is. Yeah. Who he just calls fat. Yeah. Is it fat or fats? Oh, we keep calling him yeah, fats. Yeah, fats. Hey, fats. Uh, before he realizes that, like, the guy mentions, like, oh, I haven't eaten in several centuries. And he's like, ah, okay. And he just completely glosses hey. over that fact. Hey, you're lost. <laughs> yeah, good pot pie. Yeah. Um, uh, I, okay, a couple of things. Yeah. I can understand getting completely tired with winning all the time with gambling and all that stuff, right? Where are you going with this? I'm going to a really dreadful place. <laughs> so we cut to a scene, though, where he's in this room. Right. And there's like four or five attractive women. They're stacked, as he says. They're, yeah, stacked. <laughs> they're, and they're all just sitting there. Yeah. And then he just like explodes. Like he's just totally bored of it looking at them. And he's right. just like, you get out and scram all of you. Yeah. And, it, and maybe it's just because in this version of hell, it, it's more hellish because it's television censorship. Like right. that's the extent of their interactions. Can mm-hmm. Just looking at each other. In which case, you know, that's a huge drag. But right. I mean... We see every time he rolls dice, you yeah. know, the numbers come up in his favor. Slot machines, he always wins. You would think, you know, if he's hanging out with these these attractive women. Yeah. This is like make out parties and all that kind of stuff. Does yeah. he, Do you get immediately bored by bored that? Just instantaneously? Like, no, I want them to hate me. Yeah. I mean, you got to think about it. Maybe it's just kind of the celebrity syndrome where if you can have anybody you want mm-hmm. and there's no challenge to it. Yeah. Maybe all it takes is a month. I mean, Cork, you and I have never experienced that kind of yeah. pleasure in any way in our lives. Nope. But I was reading a little bit about this episode, and in that scene in particular, I guess CBS was super wary of it. Oh. Because there's that close-up shot of the girl being like, is there anything else you need? Yeah. And I guess CBS gave uh, Rod Serling notes that when they record that scene, uh, the lady needs needs to say it sweetly and not sexually. Oh, okay. Even though when I saw it for the first time, it seemed pretty sexual. But yeah. Just reading in between the lines and whatnot. Also, yeah. so when he's going out, I think to check the records, when he starts to realize that something's amiss. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they go up this like crazy like staircase yeah, yeah. to nowhere with these file cabinets. Right, but before they leave, I'm pretty sure it's that sequence. Um, the he has three ladies in his bedroom, and he kind of glances into the room real quick, and gives them a weird look. It's when he starts to realize that things are going wrong, but he gives them a look like something's seriously wrong with them. Hmm. And I never understood what that was. Like, I thought they were going to, like, cut to it and they're all going to have disappeared or something. Yeah. It's just nothing. I think maybe he's just starting to realize that he's going to be bored. Yeah. Just having copious amounts of sex with all these stacked ladies. It's terrible. Yeah. They were stacked. <laughs> no doubt. Also, in addition to calling the women stacked, uh, he called all the cops screws. Yeah. To come and get me, Screws. I had never heard that slang for cops no. before. And then when they're in front of the uh, like the casino, a, yeah. a cop walks by, and then he calls him over, doesn't he? And then it's like a little like a little person yeah. with a cop costume, and it just was like, what the hell's going on? Take that, you screw. <laughs> yeah. The ultimate insult. Yeah, is this heaven? 
<laughs> that seems strange. Yeah. Yeah. It just also kind of reminded me of the episode with the, uh, from earlier on, what was that one? The escape clause? Is that what it was called? Yeah. Uh, where this guy has pretty much unlimited power. Mm -hmm. And if this is hell, that's a pretty lenient version of hell. Yeah. And he gets bored immediately or it takes him a month. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like he should just be more experimental as you go and have some fun. And they don't really show that. It's, I don't know. It yeah. reminded me a little bit about your favorite detail about Groundhog Day. Yep. How they revealed, like, they're in the script, the idea is that he's been there for, like, thousands of years. Yeah, exactly. But in the sh in the movie, it's like, ah, maybe it's like a month or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so, it's a it's a fun premise. I like it. Mm -hmm. it it's, I think it might be one of the origins of, like, the, uh, that Simpsons reference, oh, you like donuts, have all the yes. donuts you want. It's like, it's a total cliche, yeah, yeah. cliche, but. No, absolutely. I guess also I was reading about this. Uh, originally, they wanted Mickey Rooney to play the part. Oh, uh, that little ham. Yeah. Then he fell through, and somebody was trying to get uh, Rod Serling to play it himself, but I guess he rejected it. Yeah. And that's a good point. I guess I don't know for sure that Rod Serling doesn't play a character later on in the show. We'll I find out, won't we? He says he hasn't even appeared on screen yet. No, it's great. I hope that that's the big second season twist. Yeah, we'll find out. Yeah. So this episode, I ended up giving a six. Yeah, me too. Look at that. Ding, 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 ding. One more person in here would have been perfect. Uh, oh, I, exactly. All right. Next one, Cork. This is all you. Oh, brother. <laughs> this is called Nightmare as a Child. Lady is going into her apartment. There's a little girl whistling or humming or something. And then she talks to the little girl and the little girl makes some weird references about seeing a man. Does she remember a man that one night? And the girl's like, what? And then woman goes into her Oh, brother. I, I really don't even want to talk about this one anymore, Hanson. She goes into her house, uh -huh. and she's starting to remember, like, oh, yeah, my mom was totally killed at one time by this right. guy. Right. But I can't remember who it was. And then the door opens, and it's this guy who's like, hey, I remember when you, when you were a little kid. I had a crush on you, he says. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, you don't remember much more about that night, do you? She's like, no, no. And it all starts coming back to her. There's, like, a flashback. You see some silhouettes, and it's arguing voices very clearly the guy he's come back to clear up some loose ends and then we're gonna take it away this i this episode i don't know man well it turns out that i like this episode are you kidding <laughs> so, me no i did like it so it turns out obviously that the guy ended up killing the big mom, time and he's just double checking now to make sure that this woman still doesn't remember since she's the only person who can put a face to the murder uh so that's the whole idea. And this little girl that she sees in the beginning is just her. It's like a figment of her imagination. It's a part of her psyche that's broken off. And it's trying to inform her about what really happened because this girl has just blocked out that entire event. Woof. <laughs> I thought it was cool. I thought that really? little girl was creepy. I Look was little girl was creepy, board. but I mean... That's just something that she was born with. And I don't think she gets her kudos for like... A, monotonous line delivery in a bad haircut. <laughs> <laughs> so in the beginning, she invites this little girl into her apartment. Like, oh, I'll get you some warm cocoa. We're going to have a good time. No marshmallows. Yeah. So little right away, did you know that they were the same person? No. Okay. She had some line where the little girl's like, I know all about you. So yeah. At that point, I kind of put it together. And then especially with the chocolate bit and then talking about like she had this burn mark on her arm. Oh, I mean, like, yeah. By that point. That, like, yeah, at that point, sure. But yeah. not when I saw her sitting on the step. I wasn't... Now, when she first said that uh, she knows everything, I, I started to piece it together. So the best thing was some little girl gets in that apartment, mm -hmm. and she just asks, do people look familiar to you? That's her question. And I love that, like, the lady has the exact response, which she should, which is, I don't know what that means. <laughs> but it turns out she had seen the killer earlier yeah. that day as he makes his way into the apartment. And when he bangs on the door, the little girl just freaks out yeah and runs off into the distance mm -hmm. never to be seen but heard from again certainly mm -hmm. i was trying to figure out the age of this dude because he yeah. looks significantly older he did yeah that that's what i was doing too and then i was like as soon as he said i had a crush on you right was just like Ugh. yeah but i liked how dark that scene was like when it showed the silhouettes of the murder like mm -hmm. her screaming i thought was awesome yeah in a, in a dark way uh and then so when Let's see. Oh, I'm trying to remember what it was. Oh, yeah. So the guy comes into the apartment and he says, like, well, you know, your name when you were a kid was Marty. That was your nickname. And she's like, oh, mm -hmm. that was a little girl's name. And then... <laughs> I'm the dumb... P.S. I'm pretty dumb. Exactly. Well, that's say. coming up later. 
But then uh, you start hearing the little girl sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star in a super mm-hmm. creepy way. Yeah. Which is only interesting to me because I just watched a video with, uh, I think it's the director of Dead Space 1. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about how he used Twinkle Twinkle Little Star in a twisted way to advertise Dead Space in a scary way. Yeah. And then he was angry because I guess Ridley Scott did the same thing with Prometheus. And he was kind of implying like, we kind of invented that. But no. again, Twilight Zone's <laughs> beating him to it. And I'm sure countless people, other people have done that too, have used you know, a classic childhood song in a creepy way. Well, you can barely live a day of your life without someone making a Nightmare as a Child reference. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that title is horrible. Uh, This episode, it might be the scariest one I've seen yet. Uh, There's still that one with the cat lady on the roller coaster that was pretty twisted. Yeah. But this episode in particular, when the little girl is behind her and then it has that crazy loud music sting and it cuts yeah. back and suddenly it's the guy standing behind her. Yeah. That really freaked me out. Beyond just the pure shock of it, afterwards mm-hmm. I was terrified of where it was going. Oh, really? Go. Yeah. And this is the other stunt work uh, bit that I was talking about for when the guy falls down the effing stairs. Oh. They, they don't cut away. No. It's just a dude literally throwing himself it, down the it, stairs. The part that's especially great about that is because we couldn't just, you know, we are talking about how, we couldn't figure out how old this guy is. He seemed kind of old. Yeah. And the fact that Someone must have just like off camera just kicked him right in the kidneys like goodbye and it doesn't look like these are stuntmen both in this and the Wild West episode like it's the actors there's no yeah. fancy cutting away like it's pretty directly them no it just shows them like at the ball bottom of the series just this puddle of urine spreading <laughs> and just some loud sighing you <laughs> see his face clearly the whole time so I'm a little confused what the lesson of this episode is because it seems to me at the end the lesson is kill murderers yep. and you'll be happy yeah like she's so relaxed and pleasant at the end she finally put her mind back together by watching this murderer die mm-hmm. so i think it's a valuable pretty lesson cathartic for yeah <laughs> absolutely i gave this one an eight cork did you really i really did like this one just for how freaky it was <laughs> okay i gave it a five all right that's yeah. fair uh next episode is stop a stop at willowby and this is about a man who hates his boss, hates his wife, hates his life. He takes the train home every night. Uh, and he woke up on the train to see a wonderful town from the late 1800s called Willoughby. But he missed the stop. Mm-hmm. That happens a couple more times. He realizes that Willoughby only exists in his mind. Yep. He His life gets darker and darker and darker. Mm-hmm. And he eventually goes to Willoughby and then it reveals at the end that by going to Willoughby, that meant in the real world what he did is he threw himself out of the moving train and <laughs> killed himself. Yeah, and the Willoughby is like the last shot. They put this body in a hearse yeah. and the door shuts and it's like an extra extended middle finger. Willoughby and son's funeral home. Well, that you, you go with the middle finger, but I wondered if maybe he had seen that funeral home somewhere. And so him craving Willoughby is really just him craving death. You know, just like fantasizing about that and it's all twisted together huh. in his mind. Interesting. Just to really make it deep for you. Yeah. I have to say that when I was getting ready to watch this one, yeah. the little description, you know, next episode. Oh, I, I told was, you not to read those. Well, I saw it and it was just like, wait a minute, I've totally seen this one. An ad executive fed up, goes back to his old home or sees like an idyllic. It's exactly walking distance. Yeah, exactly. I was like, wait a second. What's up with these like put upon ad men back then sheesh <laughs> yeah i even like wrote down in my notes like right when this started i was like is this just gonna be another walking distance yeah but i did like the detail that he couldn't get off the train at first like he was mm-hmm. trying but like the second time he saw willoughby the train sped away and he was yelling at the conductor yep. but the conductor couldn't let him off in time so that's what separates it yeah it's this fantasy land that he just can't quite and it was like a hundred years or so like before right. the present time because he just kept making references to be like I, uh, you know, I was born, you know, doesn't his wife say something like you were, you weren't born at the right time or something? Or yeah. is it him? Yeah, that's definitely something. Yeah. And he has some weird line where he's talking about his wife. What is that? Oh, he says that he's just an average guy with a wife with an appetite. Hmm. I'm a little confused about what exactly that means, but we'll, we'll it's go enough to with it. Make you throw yourself off a train. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> We've learned anything <laughs> from appetites in the previous episodes about hell. Yeah. Um, so... The boss that's torturing him is just the worst guy. And all he does is he keeps screaming, push, push, push. Yeah. This is a push, push, push business. Push, push, push. Yeah. To the point where, like, I'm sure it's blending into some sort of fantasy where he's not actually saying this so much. But he just calls up this guy and screams yeah. on repeat, this is a push, push, push business. Franklin! <laughs> it's, yeah, it's like a wind-up toy of a bad boss. That's what he seemed like. <laughs> and uh, my favorite shot 
of this episode is he's in his office and uh, just being stressed out from work. And then like he's on the phone and then suddenly he has two phones, one mm-hmm. in each hand, and he's like aiming them at his own face. Yeah. And you can hear the voices come out of the phone. They're nah. like high pitched and really grating and surreal. And he's mm-hmm. just horrified looking at his phones. Then he turns around into a mirror and sees like his boss's face appearing in the mirror and all that crap. Yeah. But like that phone episode or that phone segment uh, reminded me of that bit from Louie. Uh, you watched all of Louie, right? I haven't watched the last season. Okay, it's in the first season. Okay. I remember where he's really hung over. It might be the time after he smoked a lot of weed. Uh, but he goes into a coffee shop, and it's just filled with a bunch of people going, wah, wah, Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah, just yeah. a surreal world where just the outside world doesn't even make sense yeah. anymore. That's what those phones reminded me of. And also, this episode had just a little bit more of a Mad Men flavor. Mm-hmm. You know, just going home on the train and, uh, yeah, in the ad agency setting. Yeah, and throwing yourself off of it. <laughs> exactly. I, like is that really man. an effective way to do that? I don't know. Well, was he, land- he conscious when he did it, you think? Or is it just like he got off? Because the guy kind of implied that he was walking off the platform as if there was something there. So it's yeah. not like he leapt. I think he just was sleepwalking or whatever yeah. that actually happened. I feel like we'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, certainly won't. Uh, I was reading a little bit about this episode. <clears throat> And that Rod Serling actually said this was his favorite from the entire first season. Really? Yeah, he really loved this episode. He didn't watch all of them, did he? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's just a lot of the other great episodes might be based on like a, a short story or something. Yeah. He was really proud of this one. Okay. Being original or from his mind. I don't know exactly what his reason I really, I, you got me thinking about the whole, like the Willoughby thing. <clears throat> if that was meant to be like, like the big twist or, you know, if that right. was just really where he was kind of getting that from in the first place. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. There's an also really weird moment where it's in the very beginning and he's like walking past his secretary. She's like, you need anything? And he says, I need a sharp razor and a oh. map of human anatomy yeah. for all the arteries. <laughs> yeah, Holy exactly. God. This is where this episode's going? All yeah. right. Just straight into Suicide Village. And he's like, oh yeah, I got legs. I'll do that later. <laughs> uh, so this episode, I, I liked how dark it was. I liked the fact that he couldn't get off the train. Uh, overall, I thought it was okay. I gave it a six. Yeah, same here. God, we were right on point, man. That's awesome. Two episodes that we scored the same. There we go. I think well, we're really getting somewhere. <laughs> we're making a lot of progress. Yeah. Are we close to the end of the first season? Yeah, we have uh, six episodes left. So you want to make the next episode covering six? That's preposterous. We, we'll have one episode that's just one. <laughs> no, let's do six. <laughs> All right, man. I'm up for it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in. And as always, leave your comments, feedback, conversations in the comments, and uh, see you next week. Bye, light, toilet, highlight. Yeah! Zonite. Mm. Magnemite. <laughs>